This is Modern Photo Solutions, helping you find modern solutions for life's photographic journey. Taking you from photo overwhelm to photo fabulous in just a few taps. Your story matters. It's time to start telling it. Hey everyone, welcome to Modern Photo Solutions. I'm Steph Clay and I am so grateful that you are here with me today, spending a little bit of time with me and including me into your routine. Thank you so much for doing that. I am excited to share with you something that Megan Whitney actually just messaged me tonight on Facebook. She, you might remember, was on a show a few shows ago, and she is a busy mom trying to and wanting to get memories documented in the best way possible, and of course the most efficient way because she has little kids at home. And she messaged me to let me know that she just got her most recent social book, and there was a surprise in there for her. I'm so excited about it. They are automatically adding QR codes in the My Social Book for videos that you've posted to Facebook. Yes, it's so cool that they are doing this automatically for you. You don't have to select any options. She said that it coordinated with the color on the cover of the book that she had selected. I think she selected that. And yeah, so you upload your 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 videos to Facebook and then when you order your my social book, there is a QR code there where the video should be. And then you can just use your phone and a QR code scanning app. There are dozens and dozens in the app store and you can use it scan the QR code and then up pulls your video right on Facebook where you had it. Yeah, so cool. So that you can have all of those memories right there in that book. That's super exciting. That is such a great way to be able to get things documented. And one of the things, in case you haven't listened to that show that we really loved about my social book is that it does also pull in the comments that people leave there for you as well. So you can post your photos and it includes your caption and then other people's comments, which there isn't any other solution out there that does that. It's a very affordable solution as well. Megan and others have told me the same thing, that the photo prints aren't that great of quality inside the book. But to be able to have all of those comments and even to have the QR codes added and everything, I think it is a great option for a lot of people. And then use your precious, precious time documenting the bigger things that you want to have documented in a special way and in a photo book that maybe is more durable and long lasting, better quality or in prints, whatever you want to do uh, for selective things and then use Facebook more for the day to day stuff even possibly. I don't know how most people use Facebook because I, as I've said before, I don't have any friends on Facebook. I'm a loner over there and that's okay. I, that's how I'm choosing to have it for right now. So it's really okay. And, but I, because of that, I don't really know if people are posting the day to day memories and the details and the funny stories about their kids and things like that. I would imagine that you could set up a private group that was maybe just for you and your mom or something like that, or you and your spouse and, you know, just a few select people where you could post the day-to-day -day details and then have those included in a My Social Book. Love all of those ideas. I love hearing what Megan is doing and what all of the rest of you are doing in order to get it done. There are lots of options. There's so much technology available to us that we do have lots of options. And like I've said before, I don't think that we need to pick one thing and just stick with that. I think that there are a wide varieties of, of ways that we can get our stories told and those memories documented. Speaking of technology and how it changes... Google Upload and Sync. I have been waiting to try this because I wanted to see how the rollout went. Uh, because as you might remember, they postponed it about a month. And so that made me a little nervous. I usually, a lot of times I am an early adopter on some things. Um, iOS, I wait a little bit because there are quite often bugs in things and then they will release an update. 
I noticed that my Google Photos app just barely updated tonight as I was about to start recording this, and I think it was waiting for an update yesterday, and I just hadn't done anything about it yet. So maybe, I don't know if it has anything to do with that. I'm probably going to be trying downloading Google Upload and Sync for my Mac book this week sometime, depending on the state of my internet. And so an update on the state of my internet, and hopefully this will help any of you that might have issues with internet as well. Ah, <sighs> so I've had six different technicians out here, and I have I have cable internet, and I'm sure that a lot of you that are in different countries, I know I had Aussie friends message me and say, "Hey, you're complaining about your slow internet, and it's twice as fast <laughs> as I get." <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry for being a whiner. I'm sorry for complaining, but I, I'm not getting the speeds that I pay for. I pay for 300 megabyte download and 35 upload. And I think I've talked about that before. I haven't been getting those speeds for quite a long time. So I called in, put in a trouble ticket and they had someone come out. They've had six different people come out and each time it's been a different level of trouble ticket person. Whenever I have internet issues, I always ask them to do a speed test hardwired connected to my network, but more than one. I like them to do five back to back. Um, and they, they, a lot of times they'll say, well, I have to wait 30 seconds in between or whatever. That's fine. But I want them to be back to back because that gives the room for the volatility that I've been experiencing on my network. Sometimes it does go up to 300 megabytes. Sometimes it has gone up to 330 even. But when it is down, it's down. And this week, it got down on Monday to 10 megabytes on the download. Today, it was two. Yeah. I don't even bother. I haven't even been bothering hardly at all this week because my cell phone is much faster than my internet in my house. And um, as you know, it, when you call internet, they the IS, your ISP, they want you to be hardwired connected. So I usually go directly to my router, to my modem, and put an Ethernet cable into my modem and then right into my laptop to test. And so if you're having problems and experiencing problems, I've learned that there are some things that you need to do, even before calling them. You want to restart your machine, you want to restart your modem, and you, then you want to do a hardwire connection and run at least four or five speed tests. And so that you can tell them, this is what I've done and this is what I'm seeing. And then when they come out, same thing. Um, and they, I had technicians that were wanting to do the same thing that the other technicians were doing before. And I told them, look, they've come out, they've done this and that, and I'm still having these speed issues. So finally, as they escalated it, I had, um, they wanted to send another field technician out and he called me and to let me know that he was on his way. And I said, I just want to let you know, you're going to be the fifth technician to come out. And he said, well, actually I'm going to send this back because I'm just a subcontractor. I don't even have the ability to do a lot of the testing that you're going to need to have done. So he sent that back. They reassigned it out and I got a higher level person, I guess, out here that was able to do more. And he, what he ended up doing was getting a brand new modem out of his truck and taking it to the node. And this is something to watch for. If your internet is slowing down around times when people are home from work, and that's what I've been experiencing, is that when people are home from work in the evening starting about 3 o'clock in the afternoon until about 10 o'clock at night, that's when I have the slowest internet. And then on the weekends as well, it's horrible on the weekends, so bad, especially on Sundays, so bad. And the very first time I called, I told them that and they laughed me off and I you know, I said, okay, well, when we moved in two years ago, I had the same problem. They ended up having to expand the node. Keyword right there, expanding the node. Or you can say expanding the tap because not everybody knows that jargon. And fortunate for me in my working history, I worked for AT&T right as they were installing broadband around the country. 
And so I know some of this stuff. I had to actually go to a class to learn how to build a node. And I totally failed. I didn't understand it with the co-location and the this and the that. But I throw those words out once in a while so that I look smart. And so this guy came and he and I told him, I was like, you know, I've had these same problems. These are these are the times of day that I'm experiencing the slowdowns. This happened two years ago. They ended up having to expand the node. He said, okay, I'm gonna take a brand new modem out of my truck and hook it up to the tap. Tap and node are kind of the same thing, from what I understand. And it just depends on who you talk to which they prefer because some guys do prefer tap and they will kind of, you know, not, they don't like node and other guys like node and they don't like tap. Interesting. I don't know why it is that way. I'll have to ask one of them one of these times because I'm becoming buddy, buddy with all of these technicians that come out and they all thank me for being nice to them. But he went and hooked it up and he was having the exact same speed issues. He ran six or eight, tests and he even took pictures because it was a hundred and really hot degrees outside and so I didn't go out with him but he took pictures of it and brought them back into me so that I could see what the speed tests were and they were anywhere from 60 megabytes on up to 150 not what I'm paying for so they're looking at expanding the node is what I'm understanding but it's going to take a while I did call them again today because they said if anything changed, let them know. I called them yesterday and today to let them know that my speed was pretty much non-existent. And hopefully they should be getting back to me by Friday. Crazy. The thing that's frustrating for me is that I know I can't be the only one. But I think that a lot of people, when they come out and look at it the first time, they just accept that and think that, well, it must be us, it must be our wiring, it must be something in our house, because they did try to tell me that. And so I said, test it, test it all, test everything. And they did. And everything came back fine. And it wasn't my house. It's not the wiring in my house. It's not the coaxial cable running from the node to my house. It's not any of that stuff, which they really thought it was. And then they thought that it was because I have an Apple modem hooked up to my modem, an Apple router hooked up to my modem because my some of my Apple devices, the TVs, the Apple TVs fall off the network on Netgear routers, uh, but they'll stay connected to the Apple router. So I have, uh, yeah, I have like three Wi-Fi networks in my house. It's a little crazy. It's a lot crazy and it's a little overdone. But it's what we needed in order to make it work and have not not have devices and computers fall off the network because that's super annoying when that happens and things disconnect. So I hope that that didn't totally bore you. I hope that you <laughs> can find it helpful and useful if you're having internet problems and issues in your area as well. My biggest piece of advice is to keep calling them and don't accept their answers if you're not getting the speed that you're paying for and downgrade even if necessary. They've told me that they will give me a refund once it's all fixed. I have to call a a specific number, a special number, and they will give me a refund dating from the date that I very first called about it and to the date that they, that it's resolved and the trouble ticket is closed. So I will, I'll keep you posted. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, I'll have good internet and I can get back to doing some of my testing and Google upload and sync and all of that good stuff because as it is right now, the speeds that I'm having, I can't do anything and it's so sad. Very sad and very, very frustrating because I have a lot of work that I need to do and I can't get it done without the internet. Some of you may have seen me tease a little bit on Instagram in my story about this podcast episode with a lime, and I asked you if you had any guesses about what today's episode would be about. And the reason that I posted a lime in my stories on Instagram stories is that I have been diagnosed with Lyme disease. As many of you know, I have struggled with my health for many, many, many years. And so I feel like in a way this diagnosis is a miracle. 
And over the years, I have been to so many doctors and specialists and been tested and scanned and poked and prodded and blood drawn and x-rayed and everything that you can imagine I've had done and every test has come up negative. And there are some illnesses and diseases that they can diagnose clinically, which means there aren't any lab tests that they can do, or maybe the lab tests come back negative. And that's this how it was with um, my arthritis, the kind of arthritis that I was diagnosed with was undifferentiated spondyloarthropathy, which I have since learned is kind of a catch-all a little bit for arthritis that they aren't sure really what it is or if it's some kind of another autoimmune disease or something else. And I went through different treatments that typically work for spondyloarthritis and other types of arthritis and nothing worked for me. And of course, that was extremely frustrating. And we ended up moving to Arizona because I always felt better in warmer weather. Storms, cold cold temperatures, and storm systems can throw me into bed. And they still do, being here in Arizona sometimes. It's not consistent, which is super frustrating. A lot of my symptoms are not consistent under... I, you know, I always know that if it rains, I'm always going to feel that's not always, I would say it's 90% of the time. My husband says that I'm a better forecaster for weather than anything else he's ever seen, uh, because I do a lot of times end up with pain and sick when the weather's bad, but it has been frustrating for me over the years because I still have not felt well. And I've tried everything, like everything that everyone says people need to try. <laughs> I've tried. And I had allergy testing done I to see if I had celiacs, to see if I'm allergic to gluten, to see, you know, I even went off gluten for a month um, and it did not help. Nothing helped me. This is how this evolved and how this came about is in January, I was on Instagram and I saw a post by Brighton Solomon on the 444 project. So if you want to look at them, it's a nonprofit group at the 444 and that's just the numbers 444 project. And he was talking about his wife, who actually goes around. They do a lot of charity, nonprofit work, and she goes around and does speaking. Her name's Josie. And does a lot of speaking on um, her fight and battle with mental health and mental illness. And she was diagnosed with bipolar, too. Well, this particular post that came up in my feed, and I hadn't seen anything from them for a long time because of the algorithm changing, and I saw this and he talked about how Josie had just been diagnosed with Lyme disease. And as I read that, I felt compelled to look up the symptoms for Lyme disease, which I thought was strange because her symptoms were very different from mine. Um, and I've since found out that there are two different kinds of Lyme disease. There, there's a neurologic and an arthritic. And the neurologic attacks the you know, your brain attacks, attacks, <laughs> it attacks your neurological system. <laughs> what am I trying to say? And then the arthritic kind attacks your joints. And oftentimes, the neurological form of Lyme disease will follow untreated Lyme disease that's evolved from less acute symptoms and joint pain, uh, there are less acute symptoms and then the joint pain, the arthritic kind, and then it'll go into the neurological kind of Lyme disease. And it kept nagging me. And so I did look up, I did Google Lyme disease. And as I read the, the symptoms, I was really surprised because it sounded like exactly what I had had. But that happens to me a lot. Do any of you do that? Please tell me I'm not the only one that Googles something and reads the symptoms and goes, yeah, that sounds like me. <laughs> Almost every time I look something up, I think that I have, you know, whatever I Googled. So I thought, you know, this is dumb. I think this every single time that I Google something and I, 
I think that I have it. And so I kind of tried to dismiss it, but it kept nagging at me and I couldn't stop. Like it kept popping into my mind all the time. And so I decided that I needed to do something. And I started researching to try and figure out. I knew that Lyme was kind of controversial and I didn't know why. I didn't know very much about it at all. I mean, I didn't even know what the symptoms were. I had to Google what the symptoms were. And I'm sure that maybe a lot of you are in the same boat. And you might be Googling right now to find out what the symptoms are. And there's a wide variety of things, symptoms that fit into it. But a lot of other issues and diseases, arthritis for one, fibromyalgia, Alzheimer's, a lot of these cause similar symptoms to Lyme disease. So I started researching to figure out what I needed to do and how I would get treated or diagnosed. Like, how would I find a doctor? I knew that I hadn't been thrilled with my doctors here in Arizona, and I had been to two different rheumatologists here in Arizona and had really bad experiences, actually quite bad experiences, and swore I would never go back to those doctors again. And so I was Googling and researching and came across a doctor, a practice that had really good success with treating Lyme disease. And one of the doctors just happened to be a friend of our family. I had just texted his wife a few days before. They go to our same church congregation I had no idea that this is the kind of doctor that he was, though. I had no idea that this was what he did. So I called and made an appointment, and I started seeing him. He is a naturopath MD, um, which I had a lot of misconceptions and uh, misunderstandings about what naturopathic doctors are and what they do. He is a medical doctor, and then he went back and specialized in naturopathic medicine. And he actually teaches here in Arizona at a university in naturopathic medicine. But this has been a really humbling experience for me because I've had to change my thinking on a lot of things. Uh, And that is the first one right there. So I made an appointment and I got in to see him and I told him, I said, I think I have Lyme disease. And he said, you know what? You might, but we've got some other things that we've got to look at first before we can look at the Lyme disease, which I did come back through lab tests with some other things going on that we're still working on and addressing today. Adrenal fatigue is one of them, which now we know Lyme disease will cause that. And so then we finally did the Lyme test. There are three different ways that they can test for Lyme. And the CDC has guidelines. You know, these are the three tests that you can test for. And this is what qualifies as Lyme as being recognized by the CDC. There are a lot of people that have Lyme disease symptoms that the tests come back negative. And my doctor calls that a false negative Because if they have the symptoms, a lot of times when they start to treat them for Lyme disease, they start to get better and the, and the symptoms start to get better. So it may not, the test may not come back positive for what the CDC would term as Lyme disease. And this is where it kind of gets controversial for a lot of people, depending on what they think and what they believe. And so we did the Lyme test. There's, like I said, there's three different ones. We, he sent my, he had two different labs go over my blood work. So we sent it out to a local lab here and then a lab in California because the lab in California does the third test. The lab, local lab here does two tests and the lab in California does all three of them and they specialize in it. And so it's more expensive, of course. But for me, I wanted to do that because I wanted I was hoping I would get a for sure answer one way or another. And so we went over my results and the first two tests that the local lab did here, they have different markers. And if there are so many, if you have four, I believe, four positive markers, then you have Lyme disease. On those two tests, I had two positive markers on each of those tests. Interestingly enough, the 
same tests from the lab in California. I had two positive markers on each of those tests as well, but they were different positive markers than what the local lab here found. So together, I had four positive markers with those two tests, but not on any one test did I have four positive markers from the same lab. The third test that they do, and I believe it's called the Western blot, um, that test did come back positive. Uh, it was within the guidelines of what the CDC recognizes as being positive for Lyme disease. For me, this was a miracle. I had been praying the whole time that if I did have Lyme disease, that one of the tests would come back positive so that I wouldn't have to wonder and question and I would have definitive answers and a definitive way to be treated because I have been miserable for so long. So the first question that people always ask me is, how long have you had this? And I don't know for sure. Um, My mom reminded me that I've had symptoms of this from my late teens and early 20s, which means I, if that's true, if I've had it that long, it's been decades that I've had this. Um, If it's in 2009 is when things, my symptoms started to get really severe and I had constant joint pain, constant fevers, constant flu-like symptoms um, that rarely let up, hardly ever let up. I was, I felt sick all the time and I went to doctor after doctor that told me that it was, we had just moved to Idaho from Washington in 2009. And many of them told me that it was because I had just moved to Idaho and there's different germs in Idaho than there are Washington. And that's why I was sick all the time. I, I really struggled to get any doctors to listen to me in Idaho It wasn't until we moved back to Washington for that year that we moved back to Washington that I was able to get into some world-renowned specialists, actually, that would listen to me, but still I got an incorrect diagnosis. Where Where did I get it? That's one of the next questions that people always ask me. There is a misconception that only people that live or visit in the East Coast can get Lyme disease, that that's the only place Lyme lives. And that's not true. The ticks that transmit that, and that's how the only way you can get it is through a tick bite, which is so gross, but that's the reality of it. Uh, They live all over the country. And I found a map from the CDC of diagnosed cases, actual diagnosed cases that fall within the lab test results and then also clinically diagnosed cases of Lyme disease throughout the country. And there are what I would call hot pockets that have the high, the same color code as the East Coast all over the West Coast. Every state has at least one. Almost every state has at least one. All of the states that I have lived in have at least one. And I've um, just for your information, I've lived in Washington, Idaho, Utah, and Arizona, and all of those areas have high pockets or pockets of high concentration of Lyme Lyme disease. It is possible to get it living almost anywhere. I don't know where I got it for sure. I don't know for sure where I got it or when I got it or how long I've had it. We know the very minimum is that I've had it for eight years, but quite possibly longer than that. My understanding is that this bacteria can live dormant inside of you and then um, a stressful life event can often bring it out or make it active, I guess, because it bring it wears your immune system down. Um, how do they test for it? So I kind of went over that already. I actually really went over that already. Hopefully that was, I, yeah, it's, it's interesting to me. All of medical stuff has always been very fascinating to me. And it's a good thing because we have a lot of really weird medical things in our family and it's good that I understand it. I actually, when the last time my son was in the hospital, I had a nurse ask me if I was a nurse. And I said, no. And she said, you do a very good job understanding all of this for somebody that isn't a nurse. I thought for sure you were a nurse. But yeah, I, I have been forced through 
my married life uh, to and with my kids to learn and understand medical terminology and medical things. But also my college education did help me with that as well. I majored in speech and hearing science. And so there was a lot of physiology and uh, medical type jargon that I did need to learn for that major. So how do you treat it? That's one of the things that people always ask as well. And it's very, very tricky. Uh, The antibiotics is the most common. Um, But from what I'm seeing, as I talk to people, people aren't recovering. And that's, I'm, I have, I'm going to have a request from all of you, from my listeners here in just a little bit. But from what I'm seeing um, and what I'm hearing is that people aren't recovering from antibiotics alone. They just aren't working. And so my doctor has put me on a protocol of a natural um treatment. I, it's a protocol is what we call it. It's a natural protocol. And then I'm also on antibiotics. I go, I cycle on them and then off of them for periods of time. And I'm also on some other prescription medications as well. Lyme disease often comes with co-infections and other issues, parasites, viruses, other things like that. He has tested me for everything under the sun and So far, I think there's, I'm sure there's things that I could still be tested for. We're trying to keep cost in check on all of this as well. But because of my symptoms and the way I'm responding to the medication, we're fairly certain that I've got something else going on inside my body as well. Um, Because of the white blood cell counts and things like that, that they're monitoring and that they will continue to monitor every single month as I'm getting treatment to see how, how my body's responding and how things are going. My understanding from everything that I've read, everyone that I've talked to, is that you feel worse as you're getting treatment. You feel worse before you start to feel better and that it takes months to start to feel better. And I am finding that out. The medication makes you more sick. That is true in my case, and I'm, I'm hopeful Um that I will get to that point where I'm feeling better. My doctor, he's, there's three doctors in his practice and he switched everyone over to this same protocol, the naturopathic protocol. And then there, all of the other medications are variables depending on each person's situations and needs. But he is reporting that they are seeing right now a hundred percent improvement from all of the patients that they've put on this and a hundred percent recovery which I, I'm hopeful. I, I hope for that. I'm reluctant to believe that that's going to happen. I've been so sick for so long that I just, I can't imagine feeling good again. Um, and I know that that's a hard thing for people that haven't been chronically ill to understand or haven't battled with chronic pain and chronic health issues to understand. I think that probably for a lot of people, and I know that I, I would have been this way if I weren't sitting in this place, I would have thought that it's just a mindset and you just need to be more positive. And for a long time I was, I thought every treatment was going to work and they just never did. We do have the correct diagnosis now. And so hopefully this time it really is going to work. And that's where my request from you comes in. Do you know anyone who's been diagnosed with Lyme disease. And really, I would love to hear from anyone who's recovered from Lyme disease because I have not heard of anyone that's recovered from Lyme disease and feels like themselves again, like they did before they contracted Lyme disease. And I would love to be able to hear from anyone that is dealing and battling Lyme disease like me but I would also especially love to hear from people that have recovered because I, I really am hesitant to believe that they're out there because anytime I tell somebody that I have Lyme disease, they're like, oh, yeah, I know so-and-so and so-and-so, and they're really sick all the time, and they really struggle. They've been on so many medications, and they don't feel good all the time, and that's sad to me. I, I want to believe that there's better treatments in this day and age and better better success rates with the treatment, but... Lyme disease is one of those things that is just is hard to diagnose. And even in the early stages, the symptoms that come on, 
uh, or flu-like symptoms, and then a rash sometimes. The CDC says about 40% of people experience a bullseye rash, but that comes a long time after the bite, which, you know, after the flu-like symptoms, they don't all come together. And so it doesn't really always jump out as this is something other than a virus or the flu. But the blood tests, um, from what I understand, those won't show positive unless it's more of an acute case of Lyme disease, unless you've had it for a really long time. So in the early stages, you can do the blood test, but they don't necessarily, they won't necessarily show up because it's early stage Lyme disease. So it's frustrating and it is, um, it's the mystery disease and they, and they call it the great mimicker because it does mimic so many other illnesses and diseases and the bacteria hides within your body and mimics other cells and good things that are in your body and hides really well. So it's hard to get it taken care of. But I would, I would love to hear from any of you. Um, just shoot me an email, stuff at modernphotosolutions.com. You can also message me on Instagram or on Facebook. I would love to hear from you there as well. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your support. Thank you for allowing me to come into your life because that is what makes it so that I can do what I do. I love doing this and thank you for letting me know the ways that the classes, the courses, and the podcast have blessed your life and changed things for you. I really, really appreciate hearing that and I cannot wait until we can get some Facebook lives going and a few other things so that I can connect with all of you a little bit more. And especially when I feel good enough that I can, <laughs> that I feel like I can do some of those things too, because most many days, uh, lately, especially as I've started these medications, I have a shower, but I don't do my hair or my makeup <laughs> a lot of days. So it's, it's touch and go around here right now, but I am grateful that I get to do this job because I love this job and I'm grateful that I have a job where I can work when I feel good and go to bed when I don't. And so thank you so much for your support and for allowing me to do what it is I do. And I love hearing from you. So please reach out. Thank you to those that have taken time to post in the comments as well. There were a few of you that did that, and some of you went back to some old shows and posted, and I appreciate that too. Anything that I can do to hear from you more and to be able to connect with you and to get our listeners to connect with each other. You're all on a similar journey here, and all of us, me included, we're all on a similar journey here trying to conquer our photos, get our stories told, because we know they're important and we know it makes a difference. And so let's connect Let's jump on social media and get the conversations going or in the comments of the podcast. And I appreciate it. I also did mention a while back that I was looking for someone to write some show summaries. And I did have someone that contacted me about that, which I'm excited about. I don't know how many she's going to want to do for me, but she's going to do a few for me. And I really appreciate that. So I'll work on getting those posted so that when you need to go back and look for things, they will be maybe easier to find than going through the whole entire transcript. So thank you once again and have a great day. We'll see you next time on Modern Photo Solutions.